with the seed regulation, what is at stake is the future of humanity and the future of species on this planet, the future of democracy. Because this legislation is being parachuted from the top. It is totally unscientific. It has absolutely no grounds in science. I mean, the language of pre-basic, what is pre-basic? Material that will become basic. What is basic? Material that will become certified. What is certified? That which is certified. We are talking about life. We are talking about seed as the source of all food. And this is an erasure of both thinking of seed as seed, but with it, the amazing history of seed in different cultures, the farmer's knowledge and the farmer's rights that goes with it. Across the world, farmer's rights have been recognized. In my own country, as a result of our movements, we have a plant variety legislation that has a clause. I, I was part of the expert group for drafting it, that farmers' rights to save, exchange, improve, sell seed can never, ever be alienated by any law. I know in parts of Europe, definitely in parts of Italy, there are laws that have been framed that on the basis of this manifesto on the future of seed, recognizing both the farmer's competence to be breeders, as well as the need to protect their breeding to have the biodiversity that gives us good food. This law that has been drafted is very clearly to create a new language of anonymity. You know, co multinational corporations should be called multinational corporations. They're being called professional operators, as if the farmers are not professional in the field of agriculture. As I said, the seed has disappeared, it's basic, pre-basic, etc. The nature of seed is that it is best evolved in particular climates, in particular soils, in particular cultures. We had the fortune of visiting a, a wonderful biodynamic farm, which is also a seed breeding farm. And there were three things the farmer breeder said that every scientist knows, and it's in this law of the seed of which you can get copies later for those who are interested. We've drafted this law of the seed to distill the best of science and the best of law on how law should be written, not the kind of law that the European Commission has prepared. And this farmer said, first thing she said is, it's not just the genes. The plant interacting with the soil and the climate, and she showed us how every generation the plant is evolving. And it's evolving because of the way they take care of the soil and give nutrition. The entire characterization in this compulsory registration legislation is reducing characterization to the genetic level, robbing farmers of their capacity to identify, select, and characterize. A law like this was brought into India, 2004. We did a seed satyagraha. Satyagraha is Gandhi's name for the fight for truth. And I've been at many hearings for Jose and his friends in France, from the McDonald's to the uprooting of the genetically modified rice experiments. <clears throat> These are satyagrahs, they're fight for truth. Gandhi did it with salt when the British tried to impose salt laws. <coughs> we do it with seed. Our protests, I took 100,000 signatures to our prime minister, but we also worked with parliament and the parliament rejected that draft, started to put into the law a liability clauses, because bad seed has costs. There's no liability. In the biosafety law, the international framework on biosafety, there is liability. There's no liability here. If a seed fails, what happens to the growers? Who will compensate? Who will pay? If there's contamination, who's responsible? Our seed law has been rejected. It's from 2002 to 2013, not worked. Now, we worked with, through democracy and the political process. And I'm here because I have huge faith and huge hope in 
the political process and democracy. And I hope the European Parliament and all of you will correct the damages that have been done here. Let me just point out the three most serious flaws. The first is the centralization. Plants grow from the soil up. Laws for seeds should be close to where the plants grow. Farmers should have their own freedoms to save and exchange. Regional laws should recognize farmers' rights. National registers are the best place for registration. Creating this bureaucracy of a European level registration will facilitate the introduction of unviable seeds by the industry, but will create such a burden for the farmers that farmers will give up. The second thing that's a problem with it is when industry started to grab the seed by using criteria of uniformity, there wasn't enough work done on ecological breeding. They, I mean, farmers had been doing it, but it wasn't articulated as a, as a new science. Today, we have the science of participatory breeding. We have the science of evolutionary breeding. We know that diversity is what farmers breed for. In today's time of climate change, we need diversity, not uniformity. And the farmer yesterday keep talking about how for her diversity is so important to deal with pests because everything is uniform. You get one pest attack, the whole crop goes. A second very narrow restriction is this value for cultivation and use, assuming the value will only be for industrial agriculture. There is absolutely no discussion of the value for the new initiatives that are being created of local markets, local food systems, value addition of a different kind, and a use of a different kind. This entire law treats seed as raw material. It treats agriculture produce as raw material. But seed is a source of life and renewable, and food is sovereign. Food is what we eat. The transformation of food into a commodity has reduced the industrial agricultural system capacity to supply food down to 28%. It's not supplying food, it's making commodities. And you have a seed legislation forcing only commodity production on all of Europe. So you'll have lots of maize, which will go into biofuel, high fructose corn syrup, animal feed, not food for people. And you're doing this at a time where the alternatives are bursting. People want good food. People want decent food. People don't want GMOs. People don't want food whose sources they have no idea for. People want to link to their ecosystems and to the farmers. 25% is the rate of growth of organic, and that measure only measures the market in organic, not the initiatives of local food supply. If we add all that up, the fastest growth area in the economy and the fastest growth ag area in agriculture is biodiverse-based ecological agriculture and local food system. This law is designed, one, to facilitate the introduction of corporate seeds and in enforce a deeper monopoly, and on the other hand, to strangulate the alternative that people are democratically seeking and choosing and growing. Two parts of it that are targeted to strangulating the alternative, 25% growth in the organic sector, 72% supply coming from small farms worldwide. You want to still call it a niche market? And there are all kinds of restrictions on niche markets. You can't be more than 10. No cooperative has only 10 people. Cooperatives have more than that. Seed saving initiatives have more than that. Organic farms have more than that. So this is a way of policing and criminalizing the real open economy and the democratic economy of seed freedom and food freedom. The second is conservation varieties. It used to be restriction to 0.5% of the sale and 100 acres of the planting. They're saying, they will not enforce it, but they're asking the parliament 
to pass that restriction back to the European Commission. So one fine day we'll see instead of 0.5, maybe we'll see 1% restriction. And I think the parliament should send a call. We are not a niche. We are the 100%. We will be the 100% because everyone has a right to good food. Every farmer has a right to grow food with reliable seed that's affordable, diverse, if possible, open pollinated. The conservation variety restriction, they want to maintain by taking it back. They haven't put it here. But they're talking about region of origin. Again, a very vague term. Corn could not be conserved and grown in this region in Europe because it comes from Mexico and Central America. You couldn't grow cotton. You couldn't grow lentils that come from us. You couldn't grow any of the crops that come from the centers of diversity, most of which lie in the South. Farming and seed exchange have been the foundation of agriculture. To block that exchange and to imprison the seed in this kind of law is to push and perpetuate a system that is not able to deliver. They keep talking about proportionality to the food security objective and the Cocopelli decision was all on food security, but all our research and all our data is showing that small farms produce more, biodiverse systems produce more. So in the name of food security to push uniformity and industrial seed is absolutely flawed. It is a recipe for food insecurity and food security comes from the loving care and knowledge of farmers. It comes from communities that are organized to create food democracy. And that's why from Navdanya, we are launching uh, a seed campaign, a seed freedom campaign with actions during the fortnight of 2nd October Gandhi's birth anniversary to 16th October World Food Day. And I know there is the food revolution being launched from here. I think all these trends are trends that need to be reinforced, but on grounds of democracy, on grounds of science, this document should really be rejected by the European Parliament in its decision making. And on the ground, we are there to support. Très rapidement, parce que s'il y a des questions à Vandana, je ne veux pas être trop long. Je vais juste pointer un problème qui rentre dans cette histoire, qui est une nouvelle législation qui serait mise en place dans le cadre donc, de ce paquet euh, « better regulation », comme ils disent, que j'adore ce terme, euh, qui est une escroquerie totale et qui est un cadeau à l'industrie. Très clairement, cette législation est faite pour l'industrie. Et le nouvel élément qui est apporté, qui jusqu'à présent a été complètement invraisemblable, c'est comment réussir à faire en sorte qu'il y ait des brevets sur les plantes alors que théoriquement c'est interdit en Europe de breveter les plantes parce qu'une plante doit être stable et qu'il y ait un certain nombre de critères et qu'il y avait un refus de l'office des brevets de breveter les plantes, eh bien l'Europe, à travers cette nouvelle régulation, invente un nouveau concept qui sont les semences hétérogènes. Normalement, il fallait que les semences soient sûres de ne pas pouvoir euh, être évolutives. Or, là, on invente le concept qui va nous permettre de breveter des plantes qui, jusqu'à présent, n'étaient pas brevetables. Ça, c'est un système extraordinaire et en raccourcissant le processus d'homologation. Donc, là, on a quelque chose qui est quand même tout à fait étrange c'est que jusqu'à présent, il fallait qu'une plante soit homogène et stable dans le processus de reconnaissance. Là, on va reconnaissant des plantes qui ne sont pas homogènes, qui sont hétérogènes, mais on va, et on va accélérer le processus. Le problème, c'est que qu -ce qu on, comment on va définir l'hétérogénéité Eh bien, ce n'est pas dans le document, ce sont des actes délégués, donc c'est la commission qui les définira une fois que le texte sera voté. Donc, on accepte de voter dans ce texte une nouvelle définition pour des plantes qui pourront être brevetées, donc pour les firmes, sur des critères qui ne seront pas définis de manière évidemment démocratique et qui seront définis ensuite par la Commission. C'est un hold-up des firmes transnationales de manière très claire, une fois de plus. Et on remet à la niche les plantes euh, qui sont faites par les agriculteurs 
qui, elles, vont rester dans une toute petite niche dite de conservation. En gros, on met les semences et les paysans au musée et on ouvre le marché aux firmes transnationales. Ceci arrive dans un moment particulier, et je finis avec ça, qui est très clair. Cette législation arrive au moment où on a ouvert les négociations avec les États-Unis pour un commerce transatlantique de libre-échange. Dans ce texte est prévu que les entreprises pourront attaquer les pays dont la législation va contre leurs intérêts. L'Union européenne est extraordinaire. M. Barroso est un champion. M. De Gurt, n'en parlons pas. Tous ces braves gens veulent aujourd'hui donner le pouvoir aux multinationales contre les citoyens et contre les agriculteurs. Donc ils devancent les demandes des entreprises. Ils ne les suivent pas. Ils n'attendent même pas le procès. Ils vont encore plus en avant que ce que demandent les entreprises. C'est merveilleux. Ces gens-là sont en train de nous ouvrir un avenir radieux. Merci, M. Barroso. J'en ai terminé. Ja, wir danken erstmal, dass man Dana Shiva uns unterstützt, in der Haltung, diese Vorlage der Kommission sehr kritisch zu bewerten. Wir haben das schon mehrmals gesagt, und der Kommissar hat es auch deutlich gesagt. Diese Vorlage ist wieder deutlich daran orientiert, europäische Exportinteressen auf dem Weltmarkt wahrzunehmen und nicht eigentlich die Vielfalt in Europa mit diesen, mit diesen neuen Regeln zu stärken. Das kommt jetzt unter dem Stichwort, wir wollen alles vereinheitlichen. Wir haben nichts dagegen, wenn man etwas in Europa vereinheitlicht. Aber es geht in die Richtung mehr Monotonie und weniger Vielfalt. Und dass man den ganzen Bereich der, der biologischen Saatguterzeugung und der Vielfalt der, der Erhaltungssorten sagen, in eine Nische reindrängt, ist eigentlich eine, eine Frechheit, die wir uns nicht gefallen lassen sollten. Das sind die Zukunftssorten. Diese Sorten brauchen wir. Wir brauchen mehr Vielfalt auf dem Markt und wir müssen auf jeden Fall diese Bereiche eigentlich stärken. Was wir bräuchten, wäre eigentlich genau das Gegenteil, eine Förderung von kleinen Saatgutfirmen, eine Förderung von Nischenmärkten, damit wir in Zukunft überhaupt das genetische Potenzial haben, um auf die Herausforderungen des Klimawandels zu reagieren, aber auch darauf zu reagieren, dass wir mehr regionale Sorten brauchen und weniger Sorten, die sagen, zielgerichtet darauf ausgelegt sind, dass sie einer chemieorientierten Landwirtschaft die Erträge bringt. Und es ist, ja nicht, es ist ja nicht erstaunlich und es ist ja eigentlich nicht auch um, umsonst zu sehen, dass Chemiefirmen in Europa, aber auch weltweit den Saatgutmarkt bestimmen. Ob es Monsanto ist, ob es in Deutschland BASF und Bayer sind, das sind Chemiefirmen. Die eignen sich in einer rasenden Geschwindigkeit den Saatgutmarkt an. Und dagegen müssten wir eigentlich ein Zeichen setzen. Und wir müssen die, die Rechte der Bauern äh, wieder Stärken. Das Recht zum Beispiel des freien Saatgutaustauschs zwischen den Bauern wird in dieser Vorlage überhaupt nicht äh, erwähnt. Äh, es kann sogar passieren am Ende, dass die Bauern ein Verbot haben, Saatgut frei auszutauschen. Und äh, José hat es schon erwähnt und ich glaube, das muss man auch deutlich vor Augen haben. Äh, wir können uns, und wir wollen es ja auch äh, mit einer Mehrheit im Parlament, diese, diese Vorlage so umstricken, dass sie wirklich auch Sinn und Verstand hat. Aber eins muss man auch ganz klar und deutlich sagen, wenn das Freihandelsabkommen mit den USA kommt, von dem wir ja als Parlamentarier ausgeschlossen sind, überhaupt mitzuverhandeln, dann wird, werden alle positiven Ansätze, die wir vielleicht dafür verwirklichen, zunichte gemacht. Dieses undemokratische Verfahren des Freihandelsabkommens wird am Ende vielleicht das Patentrecht in Europa etablieren und nicht ein Saatgutrecht, wie wir es zurzeit kennen. Deshalb wird, wird unser Feind auch gleichzeitig sein gegen dieses Freihandelsabkommen mit den USA Front zu beziehen, damit wir nicht alle Rechte letztendlich einer kleinbäuerlichen Landwirtschaft in Europa aufs Spiel setzen. So the floor is now open for journalist questions. If you could state your name and your media and before presenting your question. Thank you. And only journalists. Only journalists, yeah. Hi, um, Ed Bray from Agrifax. Um, Often, often when, when we ask the, the, the Commission about some of these issues that you raise, they say uh, that there's a lot of scare stories out there about what this law is really about. And they say that really this is about um, actually protecting farmers. They say that this is about the reliability of the seed 
uh, that they can be sure that they have a stable product. So first of all, what, what do you say to that? And then, and then secondly, a wider question um, about this paradigm of increasing yields. It's often the argument that we hear from uh, biotechnology advocates, agrochemical companies, but also uh, uh, widely in the agricultural sector, they say, you know, we need to increase yields to feed a growing population and that this is just isn't possible unless we have uh, an intensification of agriculture on, on the land that, it's, it, that exists, otherwise we'll be encroaching on other land. So could you say something a bit more about that point as well, please? The first thing is, when it comes to seed, farmers are not just consumers and buyers of seed. They are the breeders. And this legislation does not give that respect to farmers as breeders and farmers' rights arising from their conservation breeding production. Even the category conservation variety, as if it's just grown for inquisitiveness when it is the basis of a good food supply. These days, whenever I travel in Europe, I'm eating food grown from varieties that farmers have brought back. It's the only good food available. So farmers are producers and the most reliable seed is what they have bred. And that's the biggest link. The second is the corporate seed is not reliable about Europe. I haven't done studies farm to farm, but in India I have. There's been, we had 0% failure as long as seed was in women's hands, pre-globalization. Women would take 21 seeds and do a trial. Navdanya, the name of our movement, comes from a seed test, which is also a ritual. If one seed fails, you don't grow it. These days, every second day, I get stories of large-scale <coughs> failure of the crops. So it might be stable in terms of it looks all right, it looks the same, but when it's sold, to different regions with different climates in a period of climate change, the risks of failure are very, very high. On, in terms of yield, yield only measures the output of a single commodity. It's a highly inaccurate measure of productivity at farm level. What we have evolved in Navdanya is nutrition per acre, not yield per acre. Because yield just sees how much corn did you grow, how much soya did you grow. You don't find out where it went and you have no idea what cost it grew at. Real efficiency in farming is to reduce the costs, which also means reduce the cost of registration of seed, therefore open access seeds for farmers that comes from their own planting material. They've reduced farmers' material to basic and pre-basic when it is actually the alternative seed supply for an alternative food model. On every count, Systems of farming that are biodiverse, that are small scale, and grow many crops have higher output overall, higher nutrition, doubling of farm incomes, increase of resilience in times of climate change. So the calculation of yield is a very inappropriate measure. On the GMO question, it's doubly inappropriate because GMOs have not increased yield at all. GMOs have actually reduced yield, and we have a report in Navdanya, and it's available from the Navdanya websites, called the GMO Emperor Has No Clothes. We've done an assessment globally, every country where GMOs are grown. How much is it producing? How much chemicals are being used? Are the farmers benefiting? And on every count, it's a negative. And that's why when the page two of this proposal says, it's important to adapt to the technical progress in plant breeding. The point is there has been no technical progress in plant breeding through genetic engineering. It's not a plant breeding methodology. It's a genetic engineering methodology where you shoot a gene into a plant that has been bred by other means, by farmers or by hybridization or crossing, et cetera, et cetera. So genetic engineering is not a breeding methodology and GMOs should not be counted within this and they're trying through this, not just to expand the IPR scope, but to expand the scope of facilitating the entry of GMOs into European agriculture. Health per acre is a very detailed report. We can feed to Indias by intensifying biodiversity and intensifying 
ecological processes of soil fertility pest management rather than intensifying chemicals and monocultures because intensification of monocultures actually forces you to use more land. If I grow corn and beans in one land, I can grow twice the amount on that piece of land. If I grow corn separately and beans separately, I actually use twice the land. And this is called, in the technical language of agriculture, land equivalence ratio. The land equivalence ratio of monocultures is half to a quarter of the land equivalence ratio of biodiverse mixed systems. So we don't have the interpretation anymore, um, but you can continue with questions in English. So if there are any other journalist questions. We have our public lecture this evening at 7 o'clock as well, and there's more information on that on our website, uh, greens-efa.eu. Um, so maybe we'll see you there later as well.